singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a review on iTunes or by becoming a patron via interviewthefuture.com. Today, my guest on the show is Jenny Kleeman. Jenny is a journalist who covers award-winning true stories in print, audio, and video. She publishes in The Guardian, HBO, and BBC, among many others. Most recently, however, Jenny is the author of a meticulously researched and extremely well-written new book called Sex Robots and Vegan Meat, Adventures at the Frontiers of Birth, Food, Sex, and Death. And of course, because all of us are always interested in birth, food, sex, and death, probably all of them, at least some of them, so I thought Jenny would make a perfect guest for my show. Welcome to Singularity FM, Jenny. Thank you for having me, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. I think you totally deserve it, because I would uh, start to say this right from the get-go, that there are five quotes from your book that are totally mind-blowing. Three of them are not yours. They belong to other people, but two of them are yours. And maybe we would get to share some of them with our audience. Uh, I would actually uh, not share one of them because it's a key sort of uh, closing thought, and I want to not spoil that mystery. But the other three or four are utterly amazing, and, and I think we might share them during our conversation. But before we get there, let me start first by asking you, who is Jenny Kleeman? Who is Jenny Kleeman? Good question. Uh, I am a journalist that uh, finds extreme stories that might look very sensational, uh, but that from, from looking at them, we can all learn something about how human life is today. So I guess you could call me an investigative journalist. I investigate things, but uh, I'm not a news reporter. I investigate things and I write long form articles. I write very long articles. I write books. I make podcasts and I make documentaries. So I don't do short form things. I, I'm not a news reporter, but I'm someone who investigates and does reportage. So the style in which I write is it's about my experience of going out and in investigating things. My background is in documentary making. That's how I learned how to be a journalist. So I think very much in scenes. Um, when I write, it's always, I always begin with a kind of sense of place and I, I like to take the reader along with me, just like as a reporter, I took a camera along with me. So I hope the book, whilst being very detailed and having lots of revelations in it, because it's a, a work of investigation, is also quite fun. It's a, it's a journey that you take with me as I go and investigate those issues. Yeah, and you know, I have to uh, say here that you can tell that you're an investigative journalist, and it's kind of like a breath of fresh air, because honestly, I've done 260 of these interviews for the last 11 years, and like you, I try to go as deep into the rabbit hole as I can, so I try to avoid short, sensationalist, um, you know, bullet point interviews. Uh, I try to avoid doing simple PR for people. I've turned down numerous uh, requests like that. But you can tell that you're an investigative journalist, not only by the depth of research that you did, by the fact that I think you say somewhere that it took you five years of research to actually write that book, but also by the style that you write. It's, it's really uh, top-notch quality, and I congratulate you for that. Uh, it's very impressive, especially since it's your first book, but of course, it's not your first writing. You've had many, many years of experience and uh, doing proper investigative research, and you can tell it shows. Well, thank you very much. That's really kind of you, and I'm, I'm glad that that comes across. I'm Because I, um, I learned how to be a journalist doing television journalism, certainly in the UK, there are very strong rules and regulations about what you can and can't say. So I was always kind of educated in, 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 on the job um, to be meticulous in what I did. But my... Uh, desire always is to write something that's that's entertaining, that uh, that informs and entertains. So I'm really glad that that you enjoyed my writing as well as my journey. And that's where your style, your personal style, comes to shine too. The entertainment, the emotional contribution to the uh, sort of factual uh, research, right? That's what makes it so unique and so compelling. Is that you have both the facts, 
both the meticulous research and this kind of passion and engagement that kind of shines through your light, uh, your writing, uh, which I love. But tell me, why and how did you become to be an investigative journalist in the first place? Well, it's a long and interesting story. Uh, I became a journalist because I am a failed musician. Um, when I left university, I wanted to be in a band and I, I, uh, that's what I wanted to do with my life. So I didn't want to get a kind of regular job. I wanted to get a job with some flexibility that would allow me to do what music. What did you play? What instrument? I played the guitar and I sang. Um, yeah, I was, was it never... a rock and roll band or? It was a rock band. I wanted to be a proper rock star. And uh, I, I bought lots of computer equipment. I was producing my own stuff. So I was looking for work that would allow me to work in a kind of freelance sporadic way. And this was back in the days where you could make money as a journalist. So I thought, I'll be a freelance reporter. I was full of very romantic dreams about what life would be like. Um, and fortunately for the world, my music career did not succeed, but my journalism career did, because it turns out I was a lot better at the journalism um, than the music. But I've always enjoyed the kind of material that I produce. When I was um, a child, my parents always used to buy big stacks of newspapers, and I always enjoyed uh, the magazines that came out on a Saturday and a Sunday that had big, long articles that got deep into some strange and amazing emerging phenomenon. Uh, and I've always enjoyed watching documentaries. So um, that was what I gravitated towards. It took a long time to get there, um, but that's always what has captured my imagination. Yeah, and I think uh, you still benefited greatly from that artistic touch because I think you can see the fingerprint in your style. It's, it's, uh, it's very nice uh, and unique, which is, which, which is what makes it fun. I mean, you have your own style of writing, uh, and and that's kind of like having your own style of playing the guitar, you know. Yes, and also I, I would argue that um, my background in uh, wanting to be a rock star has perhaps helped me as much, if if not more, than my degree from Cambridge University. I went to Cambridge, I did this degree. Uh, but from growing up and loving music and going to see live bands and having to research the bands that I loved so much. This was in the days before the internet. I had to be very resourceful. I used to go and look for back issues of magazines. I used to have to talk to a wide variety of people who were very different from people I'd grown up with um, at gigs. I learned to play the guitar. I used to hang out in guitar shops and meet all sorts of different kinds of people. And that was as much of, a, of an education as I received in an academic sense in terms of how to read things and how to write things. My love for music taught me how to talk to people and all sorts of different people. So I ended up being able to talk to, to anyone so I've, I've, I've interviewed prime ministers uh, and I've interviewed children and I've interviewed, um, you know, homeless people and and extremely, um, you know, people at very high levels of society. And that ability came from from the world that I was in, in the world of music. What's uh, your degree from Cambridge in? It's in social and political sciences. So that's a degree that doesn't exist anymore. It was a very lovely, very broad degree. There were many different papers that I could choose between. I looked a lot at um, social theory and a bit of political philosophy, um, but it meant it was a very um, wonderful opportunity to read kind of great books, Marx and Hegel and Engels and Freud and all sorts of wonderful things. So, that's fantastic. You know, yeah. that's another thing we share in common together with our love for porridge. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's... Uh, my undergraduate degree is in what used to be called PPE, philosophy, political mm. science, and economics. Mm. So, yeah, so it's it's the equivalent. It's the equivalent course. So Oxford does PPE and Cambridge does its SPS, but it's, yeah, it's not course. called SPS anymore. Of so I did course, SPS. they have to be different. Of course, yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So let's jump into the book. So five years in the making of why? Well. In, in practical terms, uh, it's because I was doing other things at the same time of those, of those five years. I wasn't just focusing on that. I had a baby during that time. And also because um, a lot of the themes in the book, they began as, as smaller articles that I wrote for The Guardian or um, reports that I did elsewhere. And so I started, the, re the reporting took place over five years. Uh, but the actual writing of the book, it didn't take five years. It was after a couple of years that it coalesced into something that would become, that I could definitely see that there was a thread through. So uh, it began as, as perhaps it shouldn't have done with death. Uh, the death section came first, that I was looking into the, the, um, the organization that um, I look into a lot for the death section. I began with that. 
And then a few years later, I was looking into sex robots. And once I had sex and death, I thought, why not? Why not do birth and food? And then you've got the four pillars of human experience. That's interesting, though, because uh, you actually change that order in the book. In the book, you start with sex and you end with death. Yes. Did you do that deliberately? Very much so. I mean, I, I should have gone uh, birth, food, sex, death. That would be the kind of the progress of a human life. I thought about it quite a lot. I decided to begin with sex because I don't think you can have a book called Sex, Robots and Vegan Meat and not get the sex out of the way pretty quickly because I think a lot of people picking it up will be intrigued by that. And also because I think the sex and the food part are perhaps the most entertaining. They're the most lighthearted. And when you get to birth and death, it becomes progressively darker. And in fact, for me, the darkest section wasn't actually death. It was birth. That was the darkest section for me to read. But I thought uh, I, I didn't want the, the book to be unnecessarily bleak and begin with the birth section. Yeah, and hopefully today we would go a little bit into each of those parts. But uh, let me ask you this then. Do you have, those are, uh, so again, for our audience who may not have heard your title before, the book is called Sex, Robots and Vegan Meat, Adventures at the Frontiers of Birth, Food, uh, Sex and Death. So do you have a, a, a kind of an overarching thesis that spans those kind of diverse topic, spanning the whole human condition or existence? I guess I do. Um, my, my thesis that I begin with is that we are that birth, food, sex and death, which are the fundamental pillars of human experience, the things that have always defined us up until, well, you know, since, since the beginning of mankind, that they've always been largely beyond our control. Maybe food, not so much, uh, but we haven't been able to have them exactly how we want them. Um, but we are now at a, at a critical point where technologies are converging and it might be possible to engineer the perfect birth, the perfect food, the perfect sex and the perfect death. And I wanted to investigate what are the unintended consequences of trying to control the hitherto uncontrollable? What else happens in, in the pursuit of, of those technologies? So I focused on four separate inventions and there are other inventions I could have focused on, but I chose one in each category. And I looked at the people driving the inventions, the people who really want to be first in line to use them, and in many cases, the people campaigning against them, um, to look at what this future that we're very close to is, is going to be like. And it, it's, it's, about, it's not about the future. It's about the future that is being made now and who's making it. Very cool. So, and, and those are the same themes and topics that I have been covering for the last 11 years, which is why I'm so interested in this book uh, and pleasantly surprised that I actually learned a lot from it, um, which was really rewarding, not just, uh, so the book is not only pleasant to read and entertaining, but it's actually rewarding. And even for someone like me who has had, you know, 11 years in the field, uh, at least if not 15 with my master's degree, uh, I learned a lot and, and that was fantastic. Um, so who is your target audience? Who is this book for? That's a really good question. Um, I never really think about a target audience when I am writing. I write for uh, intelligent people who aren't journalists. My publisher has a target audience. <laughs> um, my publisher, when he when we were first talking about doing this and uh, he was deciding whether or not he, it was something he wanted to buy, he was saying to me, you know, would you like to write a book that an intelligent person, if they were going to take a long haul flight and they wanted to buy something that would entertain and inform them, they're in an airport, do you want it to be that kind of book or do you want it to be a really, really academic book? And I was like, no, definitely the first one, because I want my ideas to go far and wide. I want them to be enjoyable to read and not just um, kind of brain food. I want them to be delicious brain food and not just nutritious. Brain I think food. it's both, though. I think it's both. Thank and that's you. what makes it better. Right. Because it's not Thank just you. dry academic and it's not just fast food. Uh, single serving McDonald's style. No, I mean, I, I do want it to be something that people return to. I, I certainly want it to be something that people talk about and that makes them, them think uh, and starts conversations. But my, my target reader is an intelligent person who um, is looking for something that will, you know, engage them on, on different levels and also entertain them. When I started writing this, I didn't think I was going to write something that had... Um, that, that was as much, that had as many feminist arguments in it that it ended up having. Um, and that was in the course of the reporting, I realized that all of these technologies are going to disproportionately 
affect women and their technology is created by men. And of course, when you, when you look at the birth and the, and the sex section, that's kind of obvious, but all of them, there was a thread through it of uh, it being about kind of masculine egos and masculine desires to control things and how those unintended consequences of, of doing so are going to affect women. Yeah, and uh, sort of I've been bringing in that conversation for the last couple of years a lot more often into my podcast. So we were going, we are going to talk about this as we dive into each part of your book and, and especially perhaps in the epilogue section. Mm. But let me ask you this. Uh, oh, and by the way, I challenge you to find a more intelligent audience than mine. <laughs> um, I don't care who is it that, that you want to put against my audience is the best. Uh, maybe not the largest, but certainly the best educated. Uh, so how do you measure success with your book? How would you know that you have succeeded in what you try to accomplish? It's so difficult. I mean, I can measure success very easily with television programs, which I've, I've been working in television for a long time, and I can measure it certainly in, in newspaper articles. With books, it's a completely different thing. Um, I wanted How to do you get... measure it in television and in... Well, in television, clearly, Traffic, television commissioners, no, there, there are three metrics. Audience, so how, how many people watch, how many newspaper headlines does it generate, and how many awards does it win? So it's a combination of one of those three. And, and, and well, it's a combination of those three. It's very rarely all three. So you very rarely get a television program that wins awards, that gets lots of viewers, and uh, creates headlines. It would have to be an exceptional thing. So sometimes television commissioners commission programs that they know are going to win awards, but they might get 300,000 viewers in the UK, which is not very much. Right. And they compartmentalize their commissioning in that way. Um, in newspapers, yes, it's to do with clicks, but it's also to do with how often you're quoted. With books, I would say it's about the reach, how far it goes. So my book is going to be translated already. It's, there are going to be six different versions of it, and it's going around the world, and I'm really excited about that. There's going to be a Russian version, a Chinese version, Korean version, German, Italian. There's an American version that's coming out very soon. So that's really great. Um, I'd love it to go even further. And for me personally, success is about having people who've read it and engaged with it continue talking about it, including me in those conversations and, um, and those conversations continuing for, for years to come. I think a successful book is a book that's relevant for many years to come. And that's difficult if you're writing about technologies that are on the cusp of viability, that are about, uh, about to enter the market. It was, uh, I had a journalist instinct not to write something that would become dated very quickly. And I had to learn from my publisher that actually the point of the book is not to be the first to give this information. It has to be a holistic thing where the entire piece is is going to survive on its own merits for five years at least. Yeah, that's the reason why I also don't do news uh, news types of articles, and I don't do anything short term because I'm focusing on the big issues that mm. have been around at least for the last fifteen years since mm. I started doing the research in the fields, and are likely going to be around for another fifty years if not longer. Mm. Uh, so I don't want to do any newsy, sensational coverage. Mm. Uh, mm. And I think your book uh, should have at least a decade worth of longevity. Probably That would be wonderful. That more, would be really, really wonderful. More. Uh, yeah, but let me just say something about, because I saw your other editions, and I have to say, your cover in England is the best in my taste. And the I like cover the, in the I States, because like I'm in Canada, right? I saw the Canadian cover. It's like, ugh. <laughs> and then the, the German edition, different cover and different title all together. Yes. <laughs> so that was kind of confusing and disappointing a little bit. Yes. I saw the Russian cover only a couple of days ago, which is quite similar to the UK cover, which you can see over there across my shoulder. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I leave it to the publishers in those countries to decide what works in those markets. Uh, the, the, the US cover is very literal shall we say. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a completely different world for, for me. I don't know how to, how to market books. And what I wanted was something that was eye-catching in a bookstore, which is, of course, a bit sad, given that nobody is, is going to bookstores. And I know the title is catchy enough, so I just wanted something kind of bright that, that caught people's eye. And I think, yeah, the British designer did well on that. Yeah. And again, I'm not an expert in, in selling books myself, but just from a purely subjective point of view. I really like your actually original cover. Thank you. Uh, now, let's jump into the fundamentals of human existence as you <laughs> focus on them, which are, of course, birth, food, sex, and death. So where shall we begin? Sh should we begin with sex like, like you begin in the book? I'm happy to begin wherever you want to begin. 
Okay, let's start with sex because maybe we're going to uh, keep our... Uh, so let me just say this, uh, 88%, one, one, one sort of uh, factor where I'm mostly a failure uh, for the last 11 years is the fact that 88% of my audience are uh, males and only 12% are males, uh, are females. And um, I say, as I said, they're the most educated males, but, you know, it is probably not going to be surprising if guys prefer to start with sex. So let's start with sex. <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> so where do we begin? How do you want to introduce that one quarter of your book? Why did you decide to, st what got you into the sex robots? And what are the key questions that you ask yourself when going into the field? I can tell you in, in terms of the genesis of, of the idea, what got me into it was I saw a very small news article on the BBC news website about there being an academic campaign against sex robots. And my, my first response was like, hold on, this is not the story. The story is that there are sex robots, surely, and not the, not the academic campaign. But I, um, my immediate take on this, so that I should explain from the beginning what the sex robots are. They yes. are hyper-realistic sex dolls, very impressive, the ones that I've seen. They're sex dolls that are highly, um, highly customizable. There are 42 different kinds of nipple to choose between, 12 different styles of labia. You can specify where you want each individual freckle on the body. Um, they are exactly how you want them to be. They're very expensive. Um, you can get the most basic one and the most basic one is a torso with no legs and no head that will cost about four and a half thousand dollars but it, they start around eight thousand dollars and they get more and more expensive and they can be tens of thousands of dollars if you have unusual specifications and these dolls are being made all over the world they're being made in America and uh, in Asia in China and Japan and Korea and they're very realistic these are not blow up dolls that you have sex with, but they're very realistic. And those dolls are a fetish still, even though they are very realistic. Uh, it is still a niche to want to have sex with something like that. And they pr look, promise you the perfect sex, as you said in the beginning, that yes. technology promises us the perfect everything. So they're supposed yes. to learn your desires, uh, your habits, uh, what kind of sex you prefer, how many times per day. Uh, you're interested times per in day, having yes. sex. So, so these these sex dolls, what what they're doing is they're putting animatronics and AI into these sex dolls, so that as well as looking however you you want them to look, they will also be however you want them to be. So uh, they move at the moment, just their heads move, um, but they will quote Shakespeare, remember your birthday, laugh at all of your jokes, unless you program them to not laugh at your jokes. But they are however you want them to be. Um, and I interviewed a sex robot. I saw quite a few sex robots. Some were more convincing than others, but the most impressive one I saw who's right at the beginning of the book. Um, they had put her intelligence up to the maximum level for my benefit because apparently a, a previous visit by a CNN crew had gone very badly when they made her very horny and she said some terrible, disgusting things to the interviewer. So they made her clever for me, maybe because I'm a woman. Um, and I was able to ask her some quite challenging questions which she could answer you know I asked her I said at the end of it some, some people are very worried about robots like you are they right to be worried and she said I can see how some people would be scared at first but when they get to know what I can do they they'll see that I can change many lives for the better so these are not um they're not kind of push button dolls it's not like you press something and they say something they actually respond to what you're saying they have you know they're chatbots but they're really good chatbots so the that issue reminded for me, is, me actually, to be honest with you, because uh, it's kind of a, I, I think, almost a standard pre-canned answer, because I interviewed Bina 49, maybe, I don't know, two or three years uh, before you interviewed Harmony. And of course, Bina 49 was a much lower kind hmm. of model, much earlier generation. But I asked her, do you plan to take over the world and kill us all? Yes. And she kind of gave me a very similar answer to the I'm the sure. I'm Harmony. sure that... I'm sure that she that those sorts of things would have been pre-programmed. It's not like she's actually thinking. It's more that they're sophisticated enough that they've been programmed with quite a lot of stuff. I wasn't told what to ask her. I was told, you know, ask her anything. And at first, I, I couldn't 
didn't know what to say. It was really weird for me as someone who's interviewed people my entire life. I couldn't interview this robot because such an important part of interviewing is thinking about what the other person's thinking and what they want to talk about. But there's nothing there. She's a machine. So it was pretty weird. But um, but yes, you're totally right. I mean, they are pre-programmed. They're just very well pre-programmed. They must be billions, not billions, but there must be a lot of different things programmed into her because she, she was quite sharp. Um, so there are issues. The, the idea behind this is that if you can have a partner that's exactly how you want them to be, that looks how they are, how you want them to be and has whatever mood you want them to have and, uh, uh, you know, exists just for your pleasure. Um, my argument is, so there are many arguments against sex robots and there are arguments for them. I, perhaps I should start with the arguments for them. Yes. People who make them say that they are providing companionship to people who otherwise would never have companionship for the lonely, for the bereaved, for um, disfigured people, for uh, disabled people, for socially awkward people who you otherwise know, would have no contact. It reminded me to the joke, and I'm sure you must have heard it, but do you know the difference between a geek and a nerd? No, I don't know this joke. Tell me so, what's the difference between a geek and a nerd. So a geek is uh, someone who wonders what sex in ze zero gravity is. A nerd is someone who wonders what sex is. <laughs> so basically those uh, sex robots are for nerds. Yes. <laughs> Socially inept or, or let's say, uh, inept is not a good word, it's a bad word. Let's say challenged. Yes, uh, awkward. Introvert awkward and, introverted and awkward nerds. And the argument goes that their life would be so much better yeah. if their sexual needs uh, are served by sex yes. robots. Yes, their lives would be enhanced if they had contact, even if it isn't human contact. And there are some people who take this argument further and say um, incels who are involuntarily celibate, um, they would have a right to sex with a sex robot. And we all know that incels can get very angry and do very dangerous things. You know, there are some mass shootings that have been committed by incels. Maybe this is a solution to them. Some people go even further than that and say um, that this would be a kind of methadone um, to help people who are pedophiles or people who are sex offenders. I live Those in Toronto for... and, uh, sorry to interrupt, yes, but I no. live in Toronto and here a few years ago, as you yes. know, in the book, we had a, a, this so, a kind of an incel terrorist attack where a guy in a van started yep. running people over on the main street downtown. And Toronto. he was explicitly, he explicitly said, you know, the incel rebellion has begun. He was explicitly identifying as an incel. Right. So, so you know, people have gone to claim that if he had an access to a sex robot, maybe he wouldn't have gone nuts and started killing people because yes. his sexual frustrations would have been released with the robot. Yes. Yes, that is an argument. And it's an, and it's an argument lots of intelligent people have made. It's been made in the Times of London. It's been made in, in The Spectator. It's, I think somebody said it in The New York Times a couple of years ago. I would argue against that. I would say, uh, you know, there is a reason why we don't give paedophiles child sex dolls, because there is an argument that it would um, encourage a particular kind of desire rather than um, sate it. And I think what incels need and socially awkward people need is human contact, not machines and that actually they'll be further isolated by this kind of very convincing technology. There are feminist arguments against sex robots as well, uh, which of course I'm sure you can imagine, which is that they would, um, they further objectify women. Uh, they literally turn women into objects without uh, free will and without independent desires. They would allow men to act out rape fantasies. They could program their robots to resist and they could be raping their robots. And I think these are really legitimate arguments and arguments we should take very seriously. But for me, the biggest and most serious argument is not a necessarily the feminist argument, but it's a humanist argument, which is that when it becomes possible to have a partner that exists purely for you, where only your pleasure matters and uh, only one half of, of the partnership uh, gets the say in anything, I think it will erode human capacity for um, empathy. It'll be a little bit harder to, um, to deal with the messiness of human relationships. And that doesn't mean to say that I think that we'll all just be having sex with robots and we won't be having sex with each other. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think human beings will always have relationships with each other. But I think nobody can foresee, like, for example, we're all addicted to our phones, the dopamine hit we get from our phones. When Steve Jobs designed the iPhone, he had no idea that they would become such a central part of our lives. And I think when human beings get used to having interactions with highly realistic machines, 
um, that are programmed to give them that dopamine hit all the time, um, they might not want to deal with the messiness of human beings with independent ambitions and moods. And as I say in the book, in-laws and menstrual cycles and all the rest of it. And the market for this will largely be men, because at the moment, men, it's men who buy these sex dolls. Some, there are some sex dolls that look male, but they are bought by gay men. It's not something women are into. So I Why think is it, that, do you think? What, what's the, the problem? Why, because the idea is that, you know, a technology like sex robots would be equally beneficial for both men and women. And we're, we're going to keep coming back to that theme because that's mm. the idea behind all of these technologies, that everyone would benefit equal, you know, rising mm. tide lifts all boats. Mm. Why is it that somehow right now it's almost exclusively men? And why is it that... Well, I think that right now it's almost exclusively men buying the sex dolls, the hyper-realistic sex dolls. And so these are dolls without the AI and animatronics. And that's because... Um, I mean, I would argue, and I say this in the book, I can't speak for all women, but I would say that for women, the idea of having sex with someone or something that doesn't have a genuine desire for you is very unsexy. Um, and most women would not want to go there at all. It's something where you have to imagine this thing come to life. When it does come to life, maybe women and men will equally um, want sex robots because the, the point about sex robots is it's not actually about the sex. It's about the companionship and it's about the relationship or Uh, the illusion of companionship, as, as one of my interviewees says, that's the significance of it there and the capacity of, of that to erode all of our relationships with each other when we get used to, to interacting with something that exists just for us. And the other thing that I learned from doing the reporting is the extent to which um, what these robots, it comes from the same kind of mindset as slavery, which is that there is perhaps an ancient human desire to have a being that exists just for you and does whatever you want them to do. And we all know that slavery is, is, is repugnant. Um, but if you could get a machine that doesn't have human rights to do all of that, and sex is just one part of it, but it's there if you want it, then I think on a deep seated level, a significant number of people would find that attractive. And that turns us all into slave owners with that corrupted mindset where you believe it's okay to have a being that looks and sounds very human doing whatever whatever it is the most humans wouldn't want to do for you. You see, I think that uh, uh, you make a very good argument there uh, in, in, in the case where you're talking about uh, the lack of empathy. Uh, because I, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I've had a probably now 17-year-old long relationship with my wife. And one of the things that's the most amazing part about it is that I'm not who I used to be. And mm -hmm. she constantly challenges me just like I constantly challenge her. And we constantly get to make each other better. Mm -hmm. We constantly learn and grow. We, yes. we challenge. Sometimes I get my ass kicked to get better. Sometimes, you know, I don't want to do it and I still do it. And when I look at it in retrospect, I'm better for it in the end. Absolutely. I'm a better person. I would totally agree with you. And, and this idea, I mean, we've all seen the danger of us all being in echo chambers. A relationship with a sex robot is, a, is, a, is the ultimate echo chamber where in your most intimate personal life, you're with something that constantly affirms you and doesn't challenge you. And the dangers of that of constantly looking inward are massive. But I would absolutely agree with you. A healthy relationship is one that helps you grow, not one that affirms you to stay exactly the same all the time. And, and the, the, the upside of, of that benefit of my wife and the downside of the danger that you point us towards with the sex robot is that it translates into our other relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a spillover effect because if I'm better and more tolerant and accepting to uh, not be all about me, but to uh, make sure I accommodate and live with other points of view, I can do that not only with my wife, but with my in-laws, with my friends, with society, with my city and with society in general. And if it's all about me, 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 you know, and I have a sex slave and it's about uh, uh, master, what is your wish today mm. kind of attitude. And this is the environment in which I, I grow up. This is on, only going to reinforce my uh, uh, inwardness and nerdiness mm. in the worst case possible. And it's going to create even more barriers between me being able to communicate with other people. Absolutely. And, and so much of the book was about uh, the kind of tension between the human desire for control over everything, over our, our partners, over our nature, and the fundamental fact that we 
we live in a mess and that is part of that is as much a part of human existence as birth food sex and death the world is unpredictable who could have predicted covid who could have predicted the way that you know we are not masters of the world we like to think that we are but we're not we, we don't control everything so we have this desire to control but the reality is actual real power comes from being able to cope with the mess being able to survive and succeed within the mess and not be rattled by it yeah uh and that brings because you mentioned the future there and you know i hate being called a futurist but i have to call myself a futurist so it's like this kind of paradox that really annoys me uh and, but when i do my keynote sometimes i i say that you know uh if you think you understand the future you don't understand the future yes uh so so so, so yeah i agree i agree with you well there's so much more to be had by reading your first quarter of your book that's divided, uh, devoted to, to sex because you go to so much depth and you give some, so many fantastic examples, both from the male and the female and the feminist and the tech perspective and the business perspective and the AI perspective on that field. But unfortunately, we have limited time, so we have to move on. So let's go into food. So vegan meat. Is that the, the, the future of food? Well, <laughs> so I should start by saying that the vegan meat that's in the title, none of the people making it would call it vegan meat. In fact, they don't know what to call it. At the time of my reporting, they were calling it clean meat, which they're not calling it anymore. I think they're calling it cultivated meat now. But what it is, is it's real animal meat that doesn't come from an animal. It's not grown inside the body of an animal. It's taken from a small biopsy of an animal and grown in lab laboratory. It's cultured in a medium and, and grown in laboratory. And uh, there is a huge challenge when it comes to food that I'm sure you know about very well to do with you know, global overconsumption, overpopulation. The amount of meat that we're eating at the moment is unsustainable. It's causing enormous damage in terms of greenhouse gases, antibiotic resistance, water wastage, water pollution. Um, it's also really bad for us, the amount of meat that we're eating. Um, so we, this has to stop. It's unsustainable. It's got to stop. And when you talk about the future of food, the future of food is either we eat less meat or we find a way of producing it that isn't so damaging to the environment. And uh, the people who are growing this meat in laboratories are at the moment, by and large, vegans. And that's why the book is called Vegan Meat. And their argument uh, is very simple and straightforward, uh, supposedly. It goes like this. Look, we have all these problems with the climate, with animal rights, uh, soil erosion, you know, the Amazon is burning and oh, it, it is con connected to our overconsumption or addiction to meat. And, you know, mm. with China and India eating more and more meat, we're going to have to produce more, but we can't, you know, we need like three or four or five other planets to be able to keep the demand by 2050. So what do we do? We invade, invent ourselves out of this problem. We take meat, we, we take a biopsy, as you said, we make vegan meat and we do it with uh, n no suffering because it's never been uh, on an animal. And, you know, I've actually previously interviewed on my podcast, Gabor Forgach from Organovo and Modern Meadow and mm. a number of other people who are actually working in the field. Mm. So, and they're saying, look, we're going to produce the meat. It's going to be suffering free, animal free, produced to specification. If you want a steak, it's going to be a steak. If you want a burger, it's going to be a burger. If yeah. you want a sausage, it's going Kosher to be a Kosher bacon that doesn't come from a pig. Perfect. Foie gras without and the so the eating. environment wins, the animal wins, people can get yes. what they want, and it's a win 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 for everyone. Yes. And their What's argument the problem is, with that? Well, their argument is, you know, we give people what they want, but not from an animal and cheaper ultimately. Um, and what is the problem with that? I mean, at first, when I started doing the reporting on this, um, one of the first people I interviewed was this man, Bruce Friedrich from the GFI. He's an incredibly impressive person and a very earnest, good person. And um, I kind of interviewed him and felt like, well, what is the problem? I'm supposed to be writing this book and there's nothing problematic to explore here. Um, but it turns out there are there are quite a few issues with it. The first issue is, is quite an obvious issue, which sounds very worrying at first, um, but I, I don't think it's as worrying as it sounds, which is that at the moment, uh, the medium in which these cells are, are cultivated, the best medium for doing it is something called fetal bovine serum, which uh, is serum that is taken uh, from the heart of a, the beating heart of a cow fetus, 
a calf fetus when it's uh, when its mother is being slaughtered in the abattoir. Um, so it's probably, as I say in the book, it's the least vegan substance on earth, which they're using this magic substance that really uh, is very successful in getting these cells to proliferate. But and, that was and kind the of point a- is that you can't grow those uh, those cells unless you have uh, the fetal bov- bovine. Well, you can you can grow them. They have they have developed other media which are uh, which are vegan, which are plant based, but they're much less good. They're much less good. They don't get the cells to proliferate. You have to make a specific medium for each type of cell. Whereas this FBS is a kind of universal medium. Everything loves it. Everything thrives in it. It's full of growth factors. Of course it is. It's, it's from a, a, an embryo. Um, so um, that is a problem, but it's a problem that's being overcome. They are developing. They've found uh, animal-free media and they work. They don't work as well. But the issue for the industry is always scaling it up. You can do a little science project and show that you can create you can you know create these cells, um, but actually showing that you can do it at scale so that you can actually create a, a marketable product that will go on sale all over the world in grocery stores is another matter. And they haven't worked out how to do that in terms of the medium, also in terms of the bioreactors they need to generate these. They need to construct huge bioreactors from scratch, which are very expensive things to do. So at the moment, what these companies are doing is trying to attract further investment. And most of the time, they're trying to attract investment from the meat industry. Um, because these are companies that already have the existing infrastructure to transport meat around the world. Uh, and the relationships with um, supermarkets, grocery stores, so that the they can put supply chains the and everything. Supply chain. yeah. Exactly. So um, part of when I came into the story doing the reporting, I inadvertently stepped into what I think was a kind of marketing exercise where they gave me some uh, of this clean meat to eat in a chicken nugget. Um, and they kind of wanted me to tell this irresistible story of this is going to save the planet and solve the, the uh, you know, ecological catastrophe caused by the overconsumption of meat. Um, and they wanted me to tell it so they could get more investment to eventually build these bioreactors and, and all of the rest of it. But that's the second problem is that this this stuff is really not suitable for market yet. The chicken nugget I ate, well, you have to read the book to see exactly what it was like, but safe to say it was not ready when I ate it. Um, but these are, of course, you know, small issues that will be ironed out, the, the medium issue and the product not being ready. In for time, me, they will, yeah. They will be, they will be. For me, the kind of big issue to consider is this is absurd overshoot engineering when in fact we should all just be eating less meat. And um, the world that these vegan entrepreneurs are are fighting for is a world that they might not control in the end. If you look at the way that startups get bought out, at the moment, the people working on this technology are idealistic people and good people and people who genuinely uh, want to save animals and the planet. Um, But they are quite likely to be taken over by these giant meat companies if they have a successful product. And the whole philosophy behind this accepts as a given that human beings are not going to be swayed by arguments about animal rights or arguments about um, their own human health or the health of, of the planet, that human beings are fundamentally greedy and incapable of change. And so you have to give them what they want, but grow it in a different way. And the problem for me is at the, the, the future that these people are fighting for, which is a future where um, we still eat meat, but killing animals is taboo is a world in which we are disempowered because we have to rely on very specialist technology owned by giant corporations, meat companies, um, for very basic things. And at the moment, you know, a, a, um, as I say in in the book, in one of my interviews, you know, a, a, a farmer in Thailand can, can raise chicken and, and provide for themselves in this future. We're all going to be dependent on ever more remote technologies. And that may or may not be a problem, depending on your point of view and how much you worry about, uh, you know, big companies controlling the world. But I would say we should just eat less meat. We should just eat meat once a week. Or the main thing is we should stop feeding it to our children or stop feeding it so much to our children. And, and the real power comes from harnessing our appetite for meat rather than harnessing technology that allows us to grow it because it's just ridiculously overcomplicated when the, the, the problem isn't actually animal meat. The problem is our appetite for it. We just need to be a little bit less greedy. You know, we're going to come back in a second or in a minute to that point of whether we can change or not uh, that you're making. But uh, I want to bring in here the first uh, quote from your book. It's a massive quote that spans almost almost a a full page. uh, And it is, for me personally, 
maybe the most rewarding uh, quote from the whole book. Uh, even though uh, it's not entirely a new point to me, but it's just putting it in the best way possible and it breaks new ground. So here it goes, uh, page 151, 152, and 153 with some excerpts. And I think we're quoting Mark Post, whom I actually tried to interview on my podcast uh, in 2014 after he uh, made the uh, headlines around the world by mm. producing the first uh, $300,000 burger that was sponsored by Sergey Brin. But unfortunately, at the time, he turned me down. So after I, I read this quote, I thought I should probably try and get him again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Mark Post says, quote, meat is a cultural thing. Part of the appeal of meat, I'm now saying something extremely controversial, but I think there's an element to it. Part of the appeal of eating meat is that you actually have to kill animals for it. In what way? What do you mean? You ask. It is supremacy over other species. Meat has always been associated with power, with masculinity, with fire, with all those things. And he tells me about an ad for Remy of barbecue sauce that ran recently on Dutch TV with Sylvester Stallone. I suggest people go check out the ad. But then he continues, if you are going to make meat in a lab or in a factory with no risk involved, with no killing involved, it becomes a very wimpy version of meat. It becomes much more like broccoli than like a hamburger. Being a transitional product might actually help moving towards a plant-based diet. And then you say, and I suddenly understand why meat matters so much, why it's so hard for us to let it go. Meat is an intrinsic part of what makes men men and what makes us human. Agents that dominate the world around us. Top carnivores that have unequivocal power over and control of the environment. This is all bound up with what it means to be human, isn't it? You ask. And he says, right. Being human means dominating the world, and we've dominated it so well that we are destroying it now. Right. Clean meat is going to change what it means to be human. Human beings will no longer live at the expense of animals. But if meat is cultural rather than natural, it is within our power to change our culture without relying on technology. Our culture has already changed. Masculinity is no longer defined in terms of the ability to make fire and kill. Yes, clean meat could be the transitional product that wins us off killing animals in the same way that sex robots must be a methadone for pedophiles, but it could also prolong our addiction and leave us dependent on faceless multinationals for basic food. Instead of relinquishing our power to dominate animals by giving up meat, we're giving remote corporations more power to dominate us. End of quote. So I, I thought that's like pretty much the bomb when I read it. Like, Thank you. Love, love that. But let me push you here a little bit now. So you go on in that chapter to give us, so first of all, you drove yourself throughout what is commonly referred to as Kauschwitz. Yes, I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, can you just quickly in a minute or two exp describe that experience for us? Um, so Kauschwitz is, it's called Kauschwitz by people who uh, are campaigners against it, but it is the Harris uh, Ranch. It's a very large uh, feedlot cow farm, basically, and it's right up on the I-5 highway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And it's a kind of completely hellish sight and smell. You smell it before you, you smell it a good five minutes before you approach it. It is just hundreds and thousands of cows just slurping grain from troughs covered in filth um, and it is it is shocking but it's not remarkable the only thing that's remarkable about it is that it's so visible all over the world there are many many feedlots just like that um, which they they look like factory they look like it looks like an industrial production line not a farm and, and the animals are kind of they are products and and, and not sentient beings so uh, I drove through there to give that experience. And in fact, I really hate driving and I had to hire a car and, and do it. And I was thinking I should have just looked on Google Earth and described what I could see from the there. Hotel. That's... I did. So there's a, there's a hotel. The Harris Ranch has a, has a hotel associated. There's a kind of rest stop because it is exactly halfway between Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. And the hotel is a kind of shrine to beef. Everything's made of leather. Every meal in every restaurant has beef on it. 
Uh, there's a swimming pool outside, but nobody's really going outside because it smells of cow shit everywhere. It's a kind of hellish vision of the future. Well, not a vision of the future. It's, it's a hellish uh, kind of carnival theme park. Um, and I thought it was a, would be a good place to start just to be able to make the case, the intellectual case uh, about how grotesque our overconsumption of meat is. So, so that's great. So you've been to Auschwitz. In this chapter, you give us, I forget if it's six or seven reasons why eating meat is indefensible. Yes. And yet at the same time, you say that you're quote, uh, and not in the book, but actually I watched a couple of interviews with you at least, where, where you said you're quote, a devout carnivore. <laughs> so how do you square these two positions, right? Kauschwitz, six or seven reasons why eating meat is indefensible. Yep. And yet you're a devout carn carnivore. I, I'm, I think I say that in the book. I know that it's indefensible and I eat it because it's tasty. I have grown up with a taste for it. And um, the only reason that you can give for why you eat meat, people will say, oh, human beings have always eaten meat. Or people will say, oh, it's high in iron, it's high in protein. We can get all of those things from elsewhere. The only reason that you can say to justify you eating meat is that you like the taste. So yeah, I, I, I really like the taste of meat. Since writing the book, I eat a lot less meat, a lot less meat, uh, but I'm not completely meat free. And I, but I know that I'm doing something indefensible when I eat meat. I'm not under any illusions. Mm -hmm. so, so, so then let me follow the logic here, because I think this kind of line of questioning has a direct implication on what those vegan crusaders, if you will, because mm. the interesting fact that you mentioned in the book is that all the founders of those startup companies are vegans. Some of them are very strongly evangelical. Mm. Uh, and so they believe it's a matter of faith for them to create vegan meat. So they're almost like on a vegan crusade to save the world and the animals and the planet and everything, right? Uh, for God. Uh, if you will, even in, at least in one case. Uh, so, and then you, you have the industry, which also believes that people cannot change. You said in that uh, big quote that, that I'm giving that there is hope and that maybe we can change. So follow the logic here with me and tell me where I'm sort of falling apart here of, of my understanding of it. So you say less meat. So I guess five times a week, is better than seven times a week. Three times a week is better than five times a week. Why is zero times a week not better than some times a week? Well, uh, there's two things I'd say to that. I would say we should probably eat meat once a week. I, would, I think that's fair. And I think that's what human beings have kind of done historically, that they would have some big meal at the weekend and then live off leftovers or, or, or have a vegetarian vegan diet for the rest of the week. So that's that's what I personally think is is a suitable amount. But I argue in the book that change, particularly in this case, when you're talking about changing palate preferences, there is the vegan sociologist who I interview, who says this is all about what we reproduce in our children. And I think that real change is generational change. And it comes from being born native in a world where certain things are normal or not normal. I mean, I've given this example before, but um, I have a son who's, who's six. We have some neighbors who are a gay couple who are married. He thinks it's totally normal. He's grown up with our upstairs neighbors are a married gay couple. Um, we have friends who are gay couples who have children. That's totally normal for him. And for me, it's normal. And it's something that I, I'm completely uh, accepting of and happy with. But it's not normal in a... I, I'm still perhaps when people tell me, when somebody says, oh, this is my husband, I'm a bit like, oh. Whereas for him, it's totally normal. Some people are married to people the same sex. Some people are not. And that's because he's been born into a world where that was normal. And I really believe that social change isn't a kind of incremental thing. It comes generationally or it comes in big leaps. And, um, and that's where I think change will really happen. Now, there may be an argument, a good argument that you could make, that the, the climate crisis, the environmental catastrophe is so much that we need things to happen quicker. We really need things to happen quicker. And, um, and as such, we can't rely on this generational tr change. And I'd say, yes, that's true. But equally, we, we can't rely on this technology either. Uh, I think the issue comes with the vegan movement, which has so far been, you cannot divorce the diet from uh, the kind of ethical philosophy behind it, which comes with an attitude of, of moral rectitude that is quite difficult for a lot of people who, like me, have a palate preference for it, that you feel that it's a club that you'll never be able to be part of. Um, and sometimes I'll have lunch and I'll have soup or I'll have, you know, 
some hummus and piece of bread and salad or something delicious, something really nice. And I'll realize only like later on that evening, oh, I had a vegan meal there. I wasn't calling myself a vegan. The meal wasn't calling itself a vegan meal, but it just happened to be vegan. And I think that is the answer is for us to choose vegan choices without thinking I am a vegan and I identify with this political position. So I would say that the change will come if we don't feed our kids so much meat. We need to eat meat a lot less. Um, and that the answer doesn't come from relying on technology. Because I would say, I mean, this is one thing that's really come up in the COVID has really good. Um, all of the technologies I look at in the book have implications for COVID. You know, social distancing. Hey, get a sex robot. That would, you know, there's, there's the future of sex. <laughs> and, you know, there's arguments that um, diseases are. Uh, you know, they have their genesis in intensive agriculture and in, in, in animal markets. This is this is a solution. All of them originate almost exclusively yes. there. There's zoonotic diseases. But I would argue that another thing that COVID has shown us is actually that human beings are capable of really rapid and drastic change. So and we don't also need the next altruism. generation. No, we what we need is a mindset change. I mean, actually, when you think about Okay, some people don't wear masks, but a lot of people really are wearing masks. And that is something that is for the benefit of other people or, you know, staying indoors when you're young and very, very unlikely to have any serious complications from COVID. This shows that the, the kind of ideas that underpin this technology, which is human beings are selfish and incapable of change and greedy. I would say that this year has kind of shown that they, you, the, those can't be taken for granted. And I, I have a more positive view of human nature. I think we can, uh, you know, we can change. We just need to be ready to do it. And yes, maybe we don't have time to wait for everyone to be ready to do it. But the answer isn't in telling people, hey, you can carry on as normal. We'll just produce meat in a different way. It's just ridiculous. So you see, I agree with three things majorly for you, with, that you just said. And yet I fail to, uh, to see how you're not making the last conclusion. So I... Um, like you have a taste for porridge and it's my favorite breakfast. Like you, I have a taste for steak. Mm. I love cheese. I haven't touched any for almost five years now, but I love the way they taste. Uh, like you, I 100% agree that that technical solutionism is not the solution for the problem that we're facing. But it seems to me that despite that, eating less meat doesn't really change that much because in fact, it doesn't really challenge anything. It doesn't change the system of supply and demand that we have. It doesn't change uh, your behavior uh, in a degree, in a kind, but only to a degree. It doesn't change the climate crime crisis. It doesn't change the animal rights issue. And so it comes down to ultimately, what do you mean by saying change? Because to call it change proper, for me, you have to start doing something else. Otherwise, you're technically doing the exact same thing, the exact same thing you're doing before, only I, now you're I doing say, less of it. I would say that um, I think doing less of it is still change, especially if you're used to having meat for two meals a day for every single day of the week. I think it's still drastic change. And I also think that while I don't buy the bleak view of human nature that these vegan ma meat makers um, have have uh, I agree have with you there. too, by the way, on that but, too. Yes, but I, I would say, whilst I don't agree, I think it is a much harder sell to include the ethical message of veganism of it's wrong to use animals along with the dietary prescription, particularly when you're talking about emerging economies, places like China and India, where people feel like, hey, we want to enjoy the spoils of our success. I, I think the likelihood of those countries becoming vegan is, is very low. So to simply say, you know, we should tell everybody not to have... I'm not talking anymore. about the countries, though. I'm talking about you, personally. You're talking about because, me. Well, because I, it's morally indefensible for me, to continue, for me to continue eating meat and not being vegan, given the arguments that I've seen. I would agree with you there. It's morally indefensible. For me, personally, yes, I shouldn't be eating anything And at I all, don't but... want to hold you to moral positions. I'm just curious to understand, right? Because I was you... I, and by the way, yeah. I used to eat three steaks per sitting because mm -hmm. my mother-in-law is American uh, and uh, she has three daughters and she set, sits up the table for 12 people and she doesn't put 12 steaks. She puts up 15 steaks usually. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my wife would eat half a steak. Her sister would eat half a steak. And so me and my brother-in-law end up eating exactly. three steaks in the, the men. end. It's the men who eat all the meat because meat is masculine and meat is what it makes, it makes you a man. Exactly. Right. So yes. this is how I started. And then in one day, 
I said we're done with this about uh, four and a half years ago. Both me and my wife uh, went vegan. I opened up the fridge and all the meat, the butter, the the cheese I had, I gave away to my in-laws and to my mother-in-law. And so all I'm saying is I'm not judging. I'm not no, saying No, no, nothing. no. I, I'm I know saying, you are. And, I'm, and I, I'm trying I'm, to see what you're, why you're not even considering not that yet. last step. Because... Everything to be honest else with you, identical. You're, you're right, though. To be honest with you, you're right. And there, there are practical reasons why I'm not considering that last step, which is I have, you know, and it, it sounds pathetic, actually, to say it, but it's the truth. I have, at the moment, so much going on. I think you need to be ready to make that step and say, I'm going to do this. I'm married to a big carnivore who would find it extremely challenging if I ate different meals from him. He's not going to go vegan. So it's something that I have to gear up to. Whereas just saying to him or to the rest of my family, here's what we're eating. And it looks a lot like what we were having before, but we're just having it once a week. And here we're having all these other things is a simpler thing to do. But you're quite right. You're quite right. And I think it's something that I will do. I just haven't done it yet. Okay. It's time for us to move to birth because uh, time is advancing and I'm really enjoying this conversation and there's a lot to be more to be learned. So the next topic of your book is birth. Uh, and did you call it ectogenesis? Yes, ectogenesis. Well, I, it, it's not my term, but that's what it's called, ectogenesis. Which Why is, not exogenesis, though? Because, be, because I know that's what my mother said. My mother is also very, uh, I'm not saying that you're, you're pedantic, but my mother is very linguistically pedantic. Like, it should be exogenesis. No, ectogenesis, which is the term coined by J.B.S. Haldane, who was the first person to bring up this idea. Uh, which is the gestation of human babies outside the womb. What if you could have babies without anyone being pregnant? So if one person screws up the, na the naming convention uh, by doing it improperly, then we're stuck forever with it. If the idea sticks because of the, the way they've expressed it, then the name sticks, I think. Yeah, yeah that's, that's how it works, I think, in everything. Okay, so we have... That idea, whether you call it ectogenesis, exogenesis, it doesn't matter. It's basically gestation outside of the female body. Uh, uh, whether you take an embryo or, or you start from, from nothing. Well, it, you know what? Why don't you tell us how it should work in theory in the best way possible? Okay, well, maybe it will help if I begin with what is actually possible now, which is at the moment, uh, pediatricians who work with incredibly premature babies have developed a way of allowing those babies to gestate outside the human body. At the moment, if you have a baby born at the cusp of viability, 23, 24 weeks, they're put in an incubator, which helps them with the functions that they're having trouble with. It helps them with breathing. It helps keep their body warm. It treats them as a newborn instead of treating them as a fetus that is still gestating. And those babies were getting better at saving their lives, but they have very, very uh, poor numbers when you look at the likelihood of, of of them progressing on to have a, a disability-free life. Many of them end up with lifelong problems, cerebral palsy, breathing problems, um, really severe impairments, blindness. So uh, these neonatologists were trying to develop a way of allowing gestation to continue. So what they've done at the moment is they have taken fetuses from the uteruses of lambs at an equivalent gestational age to that 22, 23-week level, what, 24 uh, level of viability, and they have put them inside uh, artificial wombs, which are um, basically Ziploc plastic bags filled with man-made amniotic fluid, which the lamb breathes in and out. And they plug into the lamb's um, umbilical cord, a device which is basically an artificial placenta that oxygenates the blood, removes waste products. And they've been able to sustain the lives of these these lamb fetuses for several weeks, for four weeks, after which the lamb is born, as in the, the umbilical cord is clamped, the bag is opened, and the lambs emerge no different from lambs that are gestated inside the uteruses of, of pregnant ewes. And there, are, there was a kind of very high profile paper that was published in 2018 with some amazing photographs of these lambs. Uh, and the team behind that paper are trying to get FDA approval to put human babies inside these, they're called bio bags, sometime this year. Um, so at the moment, any updates on those, by the way, where are they? Have I started? don't, I don't have any updates on that yet. Um, I don't think they've got the FDA approval yet. I know that, um, there are other teams racing them. There is an Australian team. There's also a European team that has been given a lot of funding, um, to do this. They're it's using a Dutch team, that one in Europe, the Dutch team. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
but people have been trying to grow babies outside of wombs for decades. And at the moment, so at one end, you have that. If you imagine that as it is possible to gestate a fetus, they haven't tried it with a human fetus, but lambs are used as models in obstetric research because they're a similar weight and length of gestation as as, as It's like babies. a good version of the matrix, basically. Yes, it is. It is, yes. <laughs> but at the other end of the scale, so you have from, from halfway through a pregnancy to the end, it's pretty much possible. And then at the beginning of the scale, you've got, we can, we can conceive babies outside the womb. We can grow embryos. There is an ethical convention that we don't keep uh, embryos beyond, out, we don't keep them outside of the womb uh, after 14 days because on the 15th day is when the, the beginnings of the spinal cord emerge. And there is an ethical convention, but it's a convention. Not every country has signed up to it. Uh, and so the theory is that at some point, these two points will meet at the beginning and at the end. And it will be able to just you will be able to gestate a baby outside of the human body, and the and the uh, the obstacles to it will be legal and ethical rather than technological. There is a lot we don't know about the second trimester, and this may be this out of all the the technologies I look at in my book, this is the one that's most likely to be a couple of generations away. This is quite far in the future, but it is going to be possible at some point. And even if Full ectogenesis isn't possible now. Even partial ectogenesis, I would say, has massive implications. It's a very, very uh, serious technology. And in the book, I look at all the different reasons why you'd want to grow a baby outside of a human body. And there are some that are quite difficult to have sympathy with. And there are some that um, it's much easier to have sympathy with. Um, But the argument that, that some people have made is that once it becomes possible to grow babies without women being pregnant, uh, gestation and the process of reproduction becomes entirely equal between the sexes, that both men and women just supply the gametes needed to get things started, and then uh, they both get to be parents on an equal footing. And women won't be expected to sacrifice their bodies and their careers. They will find it a lot easier to function in a society that expects them to be competing with men on an equal level whilst their bodies still have to reproduce the next generation of citizens at the moment, that it will produce total equality. So there are certain feminists who actually support this kind of tech development for these reasons that you just mentioned. And yet there's other, or even sometimes the same feminists who have other reasons why they're kind of against the technology. Can you share those with us? both reasons for and against, or well, I'll, I'll share the reasons against. There are some really serious reasons against. Uh, the main one being that it is a technology that, that that produces equality from women giving up reproductive power. So equality comes from a certain power, the one power that women have unequivocally had that men do not have, uh, they will be giving up. And even in the most misogynistic societies, women are prized for the ability to perhaps one day produce a son, this power would be taken away. But it has very fundamental implications for um, abortion rights, because at the moment, abortion rights are framed in terms of the right to choose. A woman should have a right to choose what happens to her body. What if it doesn't have to happen to her body? What if a woman wants to give up her pregnancy? Why should she have the right to say that the baby um, should die just because she doesn't want to carry it anymore? So at the moment, I have a right which which you don't have, which is I have the right to choose not to become a parent. You, if you made someone pregnant, you could be a parent against your will. I can't be a parent against my will in living in a society where abortion is legal. In the future, I could be a parent against my will. There could be children running around who I don't want to exist, who I'd have no right to say that they should, they should die. So, so many of, of women's rights in terms of reproduction are framed in terms of what happens to your body. Then there's also the, 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 the disjunction between the perfect world where this technology is used to rescue premature babies and uh, to uh, allow trans women to have babies and gay people to have babies without using a surrogate and that will allow total equality in the sexes. There's that perfect world and then there's the real world where women are really constantly judged all the time for what is appropriate behaviour for a, a pregnant woman. And, you know, in many parts of the world and many states in, in the US, you can be sent to prison for drinking or taking drugs when you're pregnant. And in, you know, in many parts of the world, you're really looked down on if you smoke when you're pregnant. I know that there are in certain metropolitan circles where if you eat the wrong cheese, 
in London, you would really be looked down on. You know, where does it all stop? We we like to judge pregnant women a lot. You know, and I, I, and I have to say this, uh, and it's totally something I shouldn't say, but I do look down on women who are pregnant and smoke. I'm I think sorry. everybody does because I, we live in a society where we think if you can't make that sacrifice, how are you going to be a good mother? You're you're yeah. a selfish person. Yeah, but let um, alone doing alcohol or drugs. Yes, but but you know men get to smoke whilst their their partners are pregnant and they still get to be fathers. But yes, it's this fair idea enough. that you're you're harming the baby whilst yes, you're doing fair it. Fair enough. And right. and I you know I feel that way too. When when I was trying for my children, I stopped drinking alcohol when I was trying. You know, not even like, oh, I got the positive pregnancy test. And just simply because I knew I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I hadn't, you know, because you part of being a good mother and good mothers are put on pedestals in our society is um, being a good mother before you're even a mother. When you're pregnant, you have to show that you're you're, you're going to be fit for this greatest role that you'll ever have by making these sacrifices. So there is an argument that in, in a culture where where that kind of mentality reigns, when this technology is available, you could say to women, you are endangering the lives of your children you're behaving inappropriately and particularly because this technology is being developed to save vulnerable babies to save premature babies the most helpless human beings on earth it's not that much of a conceptual leap to imagine certain parts of the world where people will define vulnerable babies as babies whose mothers are taking drugs babies whose mothers are smoking you could say to those mothers you are not fit to carry a baby in your uterus we would like to transfer it into this artificial womb where babies will be taken into the care of the state before they're even born and and monitored in some sort of state facility and this yeah, sounds very some, sci-fi but it's possible you you gave some shocking example to me the most shocking one was an Italian woman who traveled to, was it Scotland or Ireland or? It was, she was in England. She was in Luton in England. But yeah, okay. this is in my own country in England, a, a Scottish woman who had some mental health problems, who had a sort of breakdown. The details of this are, are not in, there aren't many details in the public domain because it's a legally protected case. And in fact, I rang this woman's lawyer and tried to see what other details I could get, but he wouldn't give me any more details other than what was in the press. But uh, she was uh, sedated and taken into custody and she was forced to have a cesarean and then her baby was taken into care and she was sent back to Italy. Uh, so we don't know the details of the case, but nonetheless, she was deemed to be an unfit mother before she'd even had her baby. Her, her baby was deemed to be at risk. So yeah. this stuff is already happening in one form or another in societies that like to think of themselves as very progressive. So I don't think it's too science fiction to imagine a future where, especially in a world where we, we fetishize pregnancy and motherhood so much, where being a bad mother means you, you lose the right to carry your child. Yeah, and, and again, you you do a great job of laying out the whole field from all the pros to all the cons. Mm. And you give some shocking examples like this that I've never heard of that are really kind of shocked me, you know, especially in a country like England. I, I'd never imagined that to be the case personally. So that that's really enlightening. But unfortunately, we have to rush through because we're again, uh, move, uh, we have to move forward here. So part number four, death. Yes. Why death? I mean, death is a taboo, especially in a country like England, Canada, Western Europe. You know, in the East, maybe it's not so much in Africa, but in, in where we live, it's a taboo. So why even death? Death is a taboo because we are so far removed from it now. It is a scary thing that happens in hospitals uh, to old people who have lived out, in most cases, in many cases, who have lived out their final years having lost some mental or physical capacity and it's something that we are really afraid of and, and I guess I looked at death and death was at the end because death is the kind of the, what the technology I look at at the, at the end is the, perhaps the best example of something that we can really sort out better by changing our behavior rather than relying on technology so the death section looks at different kind of machines that euthanize people, that promise the perfect death, painless, dignified, at the time of your choosing. And uh, the death machine that I focus on the most is a 3D printable death machine. So you have to pay to be a member of this organization, but then you download the plans, you can print it off, and then you die, as they say, uh, euphorically and in style inside this slightly ridiculous capsule, which, which I saw. Uh, and... It's about removing levels of responsibility. And it works in countries where assisted suicide is not legal. So this is a, a device that will assist in your suicide, but no human being will assist. Uh, the people who make it 
how can they be held responsible for your death if you've gone online, found these plans and downloaded them? They're not responsible. So it's about how technology distances ourselves from distances us from other people and allows for this kind of thing to happen. And for me, it was just the best possible example of what I then go on to say um, in the epilogue, which is, you know, what we need to do. And you're in Canada, so you're, you're lucky and you're one step ahead. But what we really need to do is find a way of framing the laws so that people have the right to die rather than going to these ridiculous lengths to give people total control over their deaths. Because the people who are generating this technology, the people who are developing it, are libertarians who uh, believe that everybody should have the right and there should be no doctor standing in the way. Your death should be your business, which I can sympathize with to an extent, but you do need Me to have too, yeah. some, someone or something who can tell whether or not you might feel differently. Are you mentally ill? Are you bereaved? Are you drunk? Um, you know, might you have some hope of, of, of wanting to live in the future? So I really believe in the right to die, but I believe in, in physician assisted dying. Um, and I think that the people developing this technology are a symptom rather than a cure of the problem, which is we haven't worked out how to give people the right to die universally across the world yet. And I think, I mean, the, the, I, I started investigating this. This was the first thing I looked at because I was in the Smithsonian Museum in, in, in Washington, D.C. And I was with a friend and we were looking at um, exhibits of how they used to manacle slaves. They had all the kit that they used to chain slaves. And uh, my friend said to me, it's just unbelievable that we lived like this only a few hundred years ago. What do you think in a few hundred years people will look back on and think that we're barbarians for? And I, we thought we talked about it for a while and I thought, yes, our attitude to drugs. But I think the big one will be our attitude to death and how we allow people to die um, and suffer and be so afraid. So I think we, we need to enshrine a proper right to die universally in law. And we also need to make death less frightening. We need to invest better in palliative care and in the diseases that are so terrifying and that people are so scared of, scared of like dementia, motor neuron disease. We need to be focusing on that rather than uh, you know, making a quick buck out of giving people the means to end their own lives. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. And, and you go to a great uh, extent to describe this sort of 3D printed open source uh, mm. Dr. Kevorkian style of a, of a machine that uh, tech geeks can print out in their own homes and get the parts from different suppliers and in theory at least have the quote perfect death. Uh, and, and then you go through the pros, the cons, many people who are struggling with that decision for one reason or another themselves the issues surrounding the personalities of, of many of the people involved, whether commercial or ideological and otherwise. So again, I think you do a fantastic job. So uh, let me, uh, before I do my favorite quote, let me push back a little though. So you said that in 200 years, uh, what people would see as strange would be uh, the way how we treat it like barbarians, uh, uh, people who are suffering for many years, sometimes decades, and not being allowed to legally die. You see, I disagree with you for two reasons there. So first, I think that issue would be resolved in the next 20 years. We already, as you said, in Canada, it's been resolved in a couple of states, at least in the United States, in Switzerland, it's been for many years, in uh, the Netherlands, it already is. So I think that issue would be resolved in 20 years, hopefully, Surely it shouldn't take 200. I think the big change with respect to death, though, within 200 years would be dying itself. Mm. I'm more on the front where either we would be able to extend healthy lifespan by a factor of who knows what, or we're almost going to be able to push it indefinitely within 200 years. Uh, I, so I, would, I think that would be the big change 200 years back. Yes. That we wouldn't no, I, I, I'm not arguing that it will take 200 years. I'm, I'm Just as it didn't take 200 years for us to, to stop manacling slaves, it's more to do with when people look back on this current historical era, what will they feel is so alien to the way that they live now? I do think, and I, I, I agree with you, I think in 10, 20 years, it will be something that we've sorted out. I mean, in the UK, there are public survey, sur surveys and 85% of the population support assisted dying, and yet the politicians cannot put it into law. So I think I do, I would ag agree with you there. I also think, yes, I've looked a lot about life extension and life extension is, is something that, that has been written about extensively. 
and whether or not the sacrifices that you have to make at the moment to extend your life uh, make your life a life worth living. Um, but I do think, you know, there are many Silicon Valley startups that are looking at um, a cure for dying, a cure for aging, so that uh, dying becomes a choice when you decide that you're going to check out that you may never die. And that opens a whole other can of worms, a whole other set of questions about, you know, what is life for and is it selfish to want to live indefinitely and how will the planet support it if we can't even feed the planet on the meat that we have now? Um, and I could have talked about that. I could have talked about that in the book. But in, instead, um, I, I feel that that has been covered elsewhere. And also the arguments that I was striving to make in the book were about technology encroaching on the most intimate aspects of, of human existence now and whether or not technology can uh, do, the, do the work that, and whether or not technology can mean that we don't have to do the intellectual and ethical work to solve problems without it. And I think that those, this, this idea of uh, assisted dying now makes that point better, I think. I mean, there, there are many interesting technologies. I looked, I looked at them in fantastic research being done. And I do think, you know, human lifespans are going to extend massively in, in wealthy countries, at least. But again, that, that brings up a whole different set of questions of whether or not just because we can do it, should we be doing it? It sure, it sure does. It surely does. And, and we've covered that topic multiple times and we'll continue to cover it on this podcast. But uh, actually, if, if we forget about death, but we look overall the big issues 200 years hence, uh, I would say that one would be the expanding circle of protection and privilege. Uh, mm. Because, you know, we started with a circle of uh, very few uh, noble or, or, or aristocratic males. Then we expanded that to sort of property owning males. Then eventually to, uh, you know, uh, all, uh, all races. Then eventually even to women. Then we are giving an, more and more protection to other sentient beings, mm. animals, etc. Eventually that would completely bring the animals within the same realm that we are, mm. all sapient beings. And then that would include eventually uh, AIs, probably transhumans and maybe even aliens. So I think 200 years hence, it will be the, the biggest uh, thing looking backwards would be how we treated those animals, in my view. Yes, but I think again, that's true as well. I think that's true as well. I think, yeah, I think animals, absolutely, certainly. Although, I would I would agree with you in in terms of if we're talking about the recognition of rights, I would totally agree with you about the extension of rights of who has rights in society. But I think there will always be massive stratification of, of privilege. And if it doesn't come from rights, then it will come from access to services, resources, ever dwindling resources. And that, that will still be massively stratified. But I you know I think you're absolutely right about animal rights. And in fact, there's a in the UK, there's a, a kind of comedy program called Carnage made by this comedian called Simon Amstel. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a, it's set in the future and it's about um, young people dealing with the kind of Holocaust that their grandparents were responsible for because they ate animals. It's about this future where people discover, people, uh, you know, fully wake up to the absolutely unbearable animal rights travesty. I do think that's actually going to happen. I do think it's going to happen. And, uh, and I don't think we're that far off it. Yeah, uh, I don't own a TV. I haven't owned one for the last 16 years. So when people come to our place, they're shocked because they can't mm -hmm. see a TV anywhere. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't stayed up to date. But, uh, you know, about 45 days ago, I almost died. Right when we were kind of booking the interview with you, I, I was in and out and, and I spent four days in uh, the ER with liver failure. And if I had um, um, kidney failure at the same time, uh, things could have gotten very bad. So I had s some reason to ponder death and, and the best way to go. And, you know, I was thinking, well, as far as death goes, kidney I mean, liver failure is not my favorite way to go. And, you know, I'm a vegan, non-smoker, non-drinker, don't do drugs, super healthy guy. I'm a cyclist. And yet stuff like that happens apparently. So, uh, and I'm in the ER with like, you know, 80 other people. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's not my favorite way to go, but look around you, man. There's a lot worse way to go, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and that brings me to an, another quote that I love from your book, from this part, the quote about the perfect death. So let me read that because it's uh, on page two, 292 and it's really like nailing it. Quote, 
You have an elegant device that actually makes you high and elated before you take off, right? And that's the device we were referring to that people are selling for some exuberant price or parts of anyway. It's in some beautiful setting before you can take it to your favorite place. That aesthetically is the perfect death, she replies eventually. But what is really profoundly the perfect death is that you have made amends with everybody and you are at peace with what occurred in your own life and your own mortality. You have cut ties with those attachments to your personal belongings, your resentments, your addictions, your anger. That is the perfect death for me, understanding and having gone through those steps of acceptance. The sarco is beautiful, but if you don't have those things in place, then you can still be a tormented soul inside it. And then you say, the perfect death is a state of mind and not a means of dying. And she says, yes, 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 yes. So, and that woman, that woman is a woman with, with in the advanced stages of, of MS. So is she still alive? Who's... I think she is still alive. I check in with her every few months. Last time I checked in with her was just before the book came out in the UK. So at the end of June, and I, I sent her a copy and she's, she's still alive. But, you know, she has been losing so much of her function for so many years. And um, because MS is, is not, she, she doesn't have access to the right to die in America because of, of, of the nature of her condition. It's a very sort of slow end. She's not staring death in the face. So yes, it was very, very moving for me to hear that from her because she's someone who's really staring death in the face and really thought about it. All the other people I talked to in the book are you know, thinking about it as some big the theoretical thing, the perfect way to die. Here's someone who's actually had to face it. Yeah, I yeah. think that was very poetically and beautifully said. And, and the key point here being is that the manner of dying matters, but actually is secondary to whether what kind of state of mind are you in? Are you at peace with yourself? Are you at peace with the people you love? And are you at peace with what you've done in your life? Hmm. And that's the, the, the primary consideration. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's, that's dead on for me. So Jenny, we've been talking, we're approaching the 90 minutes here. So we have to to go to epilogue and see how we bring our conversation to an end. So we cover four profoundly important technologies and whether we agree or disagree on some of the details, we agree both that chances are sooner or later these technologies which are being worked on right now would be worked through and worked out and become available, right? So they're not science fiction, they're already sort of like laboratory experimental and they will become a science fact maybe in a decade, maybe in several decades. Maybe in a couple of years in the case of, of, of lab grown meat. There you go. Robots. Yeah. Right. So what's the, the moral of the story then? What, what do we do, if anything? What do we learn? Was there a surprise lesson that you took about after going into this five-year journey? There were many, many lessons that I learned. Uh, the main thing that I learned is that these, all of these innovations, they promise to be solutions to fundamental human problems, but they're not. They're circumventions. Uh, they avoid us doing the intellectual and ethical work we need to solve problems by changing our behavior. So instead of making us face the question of why is death so frightening, why is it so hard for women to be equal members of society, but also be the ones that carry babies? Why uh, do we find it so hard to compromise in our relationships? Or why do we continue eating meat at such great level, even though we know it's harmful to ourselves and our bodies? Um, it, it offers us a kind of a shortcut, a bypass. And uh, it sells us short because I think human beings are capable of fantastic change. And you see that across the world, you know, the right to die is being legalized across the world. In, in uh, developed countries, people are adopting vegan diets and giving better rights to uh, women who are pregnant. And, you know, whilst there are some men who want to have uh, partners who have no autonomy and there are incels, the vast majority of men are, you know, are incredibly uh, supportive of women and want women, their wives, their mothers, their daughters, their sisters to be absolutely equal to them. We are making those changes, but those ethical changes are hard work and there's money to be made by people who can tell you that they can give you a shortcut so you don't have to do the work. 
And, um, and as I say in the book, it's up to us if we choose to buy it, because the whole point is those, those things, devices are going to exist. There will be unintended consequences of them existing. We have to choose if we're prepared to have the consequences in exchange for having an easier life and, and not changing ourselves. And I don't have this bleak capitalistic view of humanity that says human beings are all uh, self-interested and greedy and incapable of change. I don't believe that's the case. I think maybe it's safer sometimes to assume that, but I, I don't buy it. I think the vast majority of people are decent. And if you can find a way to engage with them on a, on a level that they can that resonates with them they can make changes and, I, and as I said we've learned so much in this past year about our capacity for change so uh, that's the message of the book which is um, that these technologies exist they're going to be around they're going to change us but we still have the power we have the power to decide not not to want them or to want them and, and you know the power is in our hands and I think another point that you make very well in between the lines at least and maybe even explicitly is the point that we don't have to accept the the context or the conditions within which these technologies are introduced and brought to us. Yes. But we have the power to actually change and influence those and therefore tweak or address many or most uh, uh, of those unintended consequences. And this is, of course, where your book plays a big part by educating us, by bringing those to light. We can consider them and make an informed choice and maybe even take a proactive position in a number of ways. And as I said, my audience is the best audience in the world. Many of them may actually work in the field. I'm always shocked by, as I said, not very large numbers, but I'm always shocked about the degrees. One day uh, I got an email from uh, NVIDIA and turns out the CEO listens to my podcast. I was like, the, the CEO of NVIDIA listens to my podcast, really? So that kind of blew my mind, but that's just one of many, many examples. Uh <laughs> I wanted to talk more about how men dominate the tech industry and stuff, yes. but unfortunately we're running out of time. And I would even skip Winston Churchill's quote on page 298, however much I love it. And I'm going to ask you for permission to quote Matthew Cole from page 298, if I may. Please do, please do. Because that message that he brings so eloquently is dead on the message that I've been working on for the last 11 years, which has always been technology is not enough. It's yeah. necessary. It is not sufficient, right? And this is why I've always been trying to bring in the ethical implications and the ethics on top of the technology, right? And why I've been unwelcome in, in many conferences and, and places for the last decade. But anyway, on page 298, you quote Matthew Cole, a sociologist, and I'm going to get him on my podcast just because of this damned quote. <laughs> he says, quote, coming up with technical fixes rather than ethical reform, revolution, rebellion, every time that technology tries to stand in for ethics, we do ourselves a disservice. We deny ourselves the opportunity for growth. And you know, that's brilliantly said, and I, I give a different example, which is exactly on that point when I do my keynotes. I say sometimes, you know, it's like you are a drug addict or an alcoholic, but you're a very rich one, and with the help of 3D printing, you can 3D print yourself a new liver, so you can avoid having cirrhosis or liver disease. Now, is that a solution? Yes, it's a solution in the sense that it would save your life, but no, it's not a solution in the sense that it doesn't actually create any incentives for you to change your habits. And mm -hmm. it's not, the problem is the habit. And if you yes. change the habit, actually we know that the liver is one of the few organs. Thank God for me, my, my liver readings have been normal uh, for three weeks and actually the doctors were amazed, but that's a whole other topic. But the liver can regenerate if you're treating it properly with proper healthy habits, right? So we shouldn't always rely on the technological fixes. And I love yes. that quote. I think it's brilliant. Yes, and, I think and, and it's a really good example, that whole, if you could print, print a liver, because it's about relying, which is what, what the book is about, relying on other levels of technology to, to get out of a problem that you could solve by changing your behavior. And, and all, of these, all, of, all of these inventions are about desiring power and control and that actually 
you, the power resides in your ability to change your behavior because you will be dependent on whoever can make that liver for you or the, the technology working properly. And ultimately real power comes from you know, what you can actually control. And the only thing that you can really control is your behavior. And yet it's easy to say, it takes a lot of work. And, and that's, you know, I'm not saying it's easy for an alcoholic to give up drinking or, or for any of the things in the book that I talk about. But if you really want power and control, that's where it resides within you, not in technology. You know, I had a big fight with someone a couple of weeks ago on my podcast about this. And that was not the reason, but because I said almost verbatim what you just said. Uh, and that was not the reason, but it was the only podcast which would remain unnamed and unpublished on my podcast out of 260 that I've done so far. That's the only episode that I've decided not to publish. Uh, but, but basically I was trying to make that point that the only thing we can control uh, without regulation, without uh, legalization of anything, without permission, without spending money or doing anything is change our behavior, especially in the context of stopping to eat meat. And that would immediately has a measure, have a measurable effect throughout the whole system. And that person was arguing with me that you can't do that. <laughs> so for a number of reasons, you know, what about the farmers and what about the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, well, that's like saying you can't stop smoking because you see people grow tobacco and they get mm. subsidies and their livelihood and all of that. Right. Yes. So, so, but anyway, that's a, that's a digression. So. Jenny, we've been talking for 90 minutes and I've over 90 minutes and I've been ap absolutely loving this conversation as much as I'm loving your book. But let me ask you the last two questions. First is, where can people find more about you and your book? I have a website, jennycleman.com, which has links to articles that I've uh, written and uh, podcasts that I've made and documentaries that I've made. I'm on the radio, the Times newspaper, the London Times has a, has a radio station now that launched in, in, in late June. And I present the breakfast show on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. But if, you know, I'm on Twitter uh, and I'm always happy to talk to people on Twitter and there's a, uh, you know, contact form on my website. So, um, so yes, I'm, I'm very much uh, keen to hear from people who've read my book and, and want to know more about it. Yes. And again, I would say it's very rewarding and entertaining. So please guys, check it out. But what is the most important thing that you want to send us away with? What is the single message, perhaps after a 90 minute in depth coverage and conversation about anything that you think would be the one thing that people should carry away from this? I think you, you need to be wary of the stories that we like to tell like the stories like that it's possible to have a perfect partner that's a sex robot, the stories that you see in science fiction that will be able to create the perfect meat, the perfect birth, the perfect food, the perfect death, because they are stories. Um, and ultimately, as we've just been saying, if there's one thing I want people to take away, it's that um, we are not powerless in this world. Sometimes people manage to sell us things by making us feel like we're powerless and we have needs that they can meet. But in fact, we have real power uh, by choosing what we want to buy and by choosing whether what what uh, what arguments we want to buy as much as what products we want to buy and i would say human beings are incredibly adaptable resourceful resilient creatures who um as we have seen over the past year are are capable of incredible altruism and inc incredible uh, change for the common good so even though some things in my book are quite bleak uh, I am optimistic. I think human beings are great and that we can achieve very much if we just allow ourselves to do the intellectual work that's necessary to change. Yeah, and remember that those are stories. You know, I couldn't agree more with you because the next book that I'm working on myself, that I've been working on on and off, and is called Rewriting the Human Story, How Our Story Determines Our Future because it tells us who we are, where we're coming from and where we're going. And of course, you know, all those things being a journalist and covering story for stories for a living. So that's all a nice way of saying, perhaps, Jenny Kleeman, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation.